get the idea of the fact we've got to use a PA, but apparently the recording doesn't work unless I use one, so here we go. Right, um, a bit of history. You want to know who am I and why am I talking, and this may make, it, make some of this stuff a little bit more sense. Um, I actually trained to be a mountain guide years ago, so um, for me it was all about having everything as light as physically possible. Also, I've experienced um, some pretty awful conditions in mountain environments where basically the winds have sort of like going above 60 or 70 miles an hour. The tent you're seeing basically is something I actually designed for mountain use, basically. Um, I've si since adopted it for use when I do radio trips, etc., etc. So that's why that's been put up so at least people can see. It's not something, it's not an off-the-shelf, you can't go and buy it. I literally put it together, but it kind of works. And those people who are here when, you put it, when I put it together will probably realise the poles, if I need to, I can actually load those as well. <laughs> All right, um, what is QRP? Um, I'm not one of these people who wants to be religious or pragmatic, religious about it, basically, to be completely honest. Um, I've worked in some places in the world where some people have turned around and said QRP is 100 watts. Um, but in real terms, the definition on CW is 5 watts and on SSB 10. I'll be honest, that's pushing it. Um, but I'll be honest, most of the time I've actually worked in some of these locations with an awful lot less power than that. And it can be done. But you just have to, to be honest, use a bit of smarts on this one. Um, one of the other things is, um, as part of the talk, is basically what exactly does DX mean? Um, DX means different things to different people. Um, sometimes, uh, show of hands if I may, how many people have ever actually operated portable? Good, right, fine, okay, so you understand where I'm coming from. As far as I'm concerned, sometimes, even if you're, you're a G station, you're working other G stations, and you're portable, you've got out, you've got in your, bar, your, um, your bicycle, your car, or whatever else, and you're operating somewhere else, you're DX as far as I'm concerned, because you're completely self-contained. You're no longer, you're off the grid. You're no longer relying on anything else local. So you're the DX. Um, one thing definitely, which is probably a better definition, is if you're not in your own country. How many people here have ever actually taken a radio on a holiday? Okay. How many people have actually operated it and actually had fun doing it? Great. So you're already there. Um, then there are some people who are real purists who turn around and say, unless you're at least a thousand miles away and outside Europe, it doesn't count. <laughs> um, unfortunately, well, fortunately or unfortunately, I've actually operated in both categories. Um, oh, let me see. Um, in typical Camham style, basically, my presentation was written this morning. So I may get the, uh, um, the in, in slightly wrong order. Um, a while ago, back in 2013, I did one thing. I'll jump around here a little bit, but just to let you know, I actually went to American Samoa, KH8, and when I arrived, basically, this chap here, G6 um, uh, H00, was actually hosted me in um, Hawaii for literally about 12 hours whilst I was waiting for a flight to then go back down to American Samoa. And rather than stay in the hotel, he said, why don't you come along and we'll have a DX breakfast? Little did I know, the people who were doing a DX breakfast, the person who took the photograph is a chap um, called Tetz. He's a um, Japanese guy. I'm sure some people will know him in the DX community. This is John Peters and a chap called Will. These three guys are the three guys who actually activated Swain's Island 30 years ago. And they did it with 30 watts. So when Bill turned around and told them, basically, I was going down to American Samoa with QRP with 5 watts, these guys said, we've just got to meet him. <laughs> <laughs> so that's why that happened. But it's, it's all about research, basically. If you're going to go on any one of these trips, you're not going to be spending five pounds. You're going to be spending a thousand pounds or even more. So you need to do your research. To be honest, if you plan to, what's that expression? If you plan to fail, or sorry, if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. When you're doing QRP, the expedition, it's absolutely vital you get your research done first. Sometimes some of the trips I've actually put it together, even some of the ones I'm planning now, have taken me two or three years to actually organize and sort out. So it's vital. There's all sorts of sources you can get things. Everyone here knows Google Earth. I can't think of a better source for help for QRP operators when you want to go to DX locations. It's great you can find the five-star hotel, you can find whatever, but there's nothing better than being able to go onto, QRP, onto Google Earth, put in the location where you're going island-wise, and then, lo and behold, it'll turn around and point out where all of the beaches are where you get short path back to the UK. <laughs> um, it works really, really well. I'm also one of those people where I talk to absolutely everyone. Um, I'm in the previous job, basically, well, I still work in IT, but I used to actually travel around all over the world. 
I used to make it a point of literally whoever I was speaking, sitting next to, you're on the same plane for eight hours and all the rest of it. I probably bored them stupid about radio, amateur radio, for the entire journey of the flight. But every now and then you meet some really, really interesting people. I haven't got a photograph because I forgot to bring it with me, but on one flight I actually met about half of the American set at Senate because they were all on the flight because they're actually returning to America because they've been on a fact-finding trip, which was brilliant because all of a sudden, basically, I suddenly get all of their personal emails, which is great if you ever actually want to go to one of those places which is banned. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, one of the things that it's vital when you do um, a trip is, is this. Um, I think th this I did literally just before the KHA trip. The reason I've shown the slide is just to make something obvious. Um, Everyone knows when you're in the Pacific, basically, the bands shut down, or you're near the equator, they shut down effectively during the day local time. This is actually showing UTC for the UK, but for obvious reasons, I was in American Samoa, okay? My trusty globe, which I've actually taken everywhere on trips with me. So, here's the UK, and American Samoa is there. I mean, you can't get further away, basically. So, when it's midday here, it's midnight there. So effectively what I did is I ran this, this little um, planning program to figure out what's the probability of me with my tiny little antenna, tiny little power station, being able to actually work anyone back in the UK. To be honest, if all of these, fig all of these um, images had been blue, to be honest, I'd have just probably carried on working Russians, Japanese, um, VKs and, v and ZLs. But I actually wanted to see if I could actually get some Gs and Europeans into the log. My second QSO on that trip was actually with an SV-8 who was sitting on a quayside running a QRP station and he was tuning it up. He actually came back to me. He thought I said my call sign was M1KTA. He missed the KH8 bit. <laughs> so um, his full call sign is um, SV-8COL. He actually put it on YouTube because he couldn't believe it. Um, again, very quick, just jumping around. That's basically my, pretty much my standard kit list. Now, it may sound crazy, I've put times two, and I'm not kidding. If you've spent that much time and effort to actually go to these places, the last thing you want to do is for something to fail. Um, so I've actually got two KX3s. I've actually got three, because I've, I've killed one. Um, I carry two laptops, basically. Whenever I buy a laptop, I buy another one exactly the same. So if anything goes wrong with one, I've immediately got another one to work. Um, all of that... All of that kit, basically, plus, plus most of the stuff you can see here, I can actually carry on most flights without a problem. Yeah. And that's the other thing is, basically, if I can't carry it, it doesn't come with me. It's that simple as well. You've got to be really brutal. That does mean sometimes, basically, your clothing drops down to being a T-shirt and a pair of shorts, and you wear the same thing for a week. But what the hell? We're radio amateurs. Um, some people may have turned around and joked about the fact there's marigold gloves on there. This is an interesting story. Um, I don't know if many people know, but I do the Biru contest from time to time. And one of the places I went to to do the Biru contest, the hotel I was in, they'd, put a, they'd had a, a live neutral reverse on their mains. There was no earth whatsoever. And if you plugged in anything of any description into the hotel power supply, basically, you got zapped. <laughs> so it wasn't very nice. So um, I now carry with me everywhere a main socket tester. You can go into a pound shop. Everyone knows a pound shop. They will. They'll cost you a pound. Take it with you, bung it in your bag, basically. When you go anywhere, take it and plug it into the mains of the hotel. It'll turn around and tell you whether or not it's safe. Then the other thing is basically the marigold gloves, for obvious reasons, they're insulators. I kid you not, in 85% humidity, 35 degrees centigrade, I wear marigold gloves and I did the beer contest. <laughs> because it was a safe way to do it. Um, I've also got um, an ex-CCTV power supply. The reason I've got it is because, one, it's RFI friendly, it's incredibly lightweight, and it's also a pure switch mode, so it'll actually go all the way from 70 volts all the way up to about 290 or something like that. I did the thing where basically you turn around and try to power your kit in your shack with a variac and sort of like muck around with it and figure out whether or not it's going to blow or not. The reason I do that is it's fine to turn around and actually rely on a power supply you've got in the UK, but when you go to some of these places, you can never rely on the mains. And unfortunately, I'm not like a T32C trip, where basically you can actually afford to take along an electrician to figure it out, and they're going to lay, lay new mains. So I've got to figure it all out for myself. Okay, antenna bits, very, very quickly I'll go through. Because I've only got a, a, a brief example of what I've got. But this may be an anathema to some of the QRP guys, but basically I do not believe in using a tuner if I can help it. It's absolutely vital. If I'm going to be doing all this 
doing all this work and all this effort to go somewhere and I'm putting five watts into an antenna, I want all five watts to go into the antenna. So um, I had a brief chat with Martin Lynch downstairs. He hasn't got any, otherwise I, I borrowed a reel. But you can get incredibly low loss um, coax that's as thin as RG58 is, or thinner. I've actually got an example which I actually pinched off um, um, a Swedish military uh, missile site, but I won't go into that, um, which is exactly the same type. It, they tend to be um, stranded, so they're flexible. They're multi uh, it's got a polythene core, so polythene wrapper around it, and it's basically double wrapped. So it's a perfect, perfect coax to be turning around and taking if, if you're actually going to go QRP. I had a chat with Michael, G7VJR. That coax is actually fine as long as the VSWR of your antenna is okay at 400 watts. I wouldn't want it to last very long, basically, if the VSWR changed, but QRP, you can sort of like take a few liberties. But one of the things I use is um, a buddy pole. I've used this non-stop almost since about 2006, 2007. It's very simple in concept, basically. It's a 16-foot um, tripod. Your feed point, you've got multiple ways you can actually run it. Two fixed static 22-inch arms, a loading coil, and a whip. So effectively what you can do is you can actually tune your antenna to get exactly the frequency you want. Um, I know it works because um, of some of the pileups I've actually had in some locations. And it's incredibly light and to be honest it's also it's commercial. So if you've got a jobs worth security person, he's not going to go, what's that? He's going to understand it's an antenna or whatever else. It's in a bag. So basically they don't, they don't question what you're taking with you. That's one of the other reasons why basically I don't take homebrew QRP rigs with me. I'm, I use the KX3. The simple reason is what I all quite usually do is I take a mag copy of a magazine which has actually got an advertisement for the KX3 in it. Because there's nothing easier, especially if language is a problem. You can turn around and actually show the security person, here you go, it's a standard product. Waves you through no problems at all. It's not quite the same when you leave the country at 3 o'clock in the morning and you go through security because they think they're called a spy, but that's a different matter. <laughs> um, this one's a key. Um, I made a conscious decision a long time ago. I was actually going to go to some of these places and make certain I was going to the best location for me, which basically meant it had to be a good location, good RF takeoff, clear, clear path to, you know, basically other people I wanted to contact. If you go to some of the islands, you'll probably find, the crazy thing is, they usually, especially if they're volcanic islands in the Pacific, they've actually got all of the hotels on the south side of the islands, which is nuts, nuts for us. So a very, very quick trip, Google Earth and all the rest of it, and you'll figure out there's nice beaches on the north. Now, unlike someone who's reliant on basically a generator, a mains connection, all the rest of it, QRP, we can go wherever we want. So that's what I did. Half an hour before sunset, I put my tent up, put my antennas up, got a car battery, it was actually a motorcycle battery at the time, a motorcycle battery out and got ready to operate. A motorcycle battery QRP will last you through the entire night without a problem. Oh, and by the way, I don't normally log in these locations with a laptop, I do it on, on paper, then I transfer it afterwards. There's another reason for doing that, is it's too easy for laptops, even if I've got two of them, for them, one of them to suddenly go and it stops working, whereas if you've got a paper log, the chances are, unless it gets wet, which is a different issue, basically, you, you usually don't lose your, cont your, your QSA lists. Good question. How do you carry that you don't. you don't. You don't. One of the first things you do when you get off the plane is you turn around and ask the taxi driver, can you please turn around and take me to a motorbike rental shop? <laughs> and then what you do is you go into the place and ask them, do they have any brand new batteries? Now, if you're going to go to places like West Africa or somewhere in the tropics, they don't actually sell the batteries fully charged. They sell them dry. So what you have to do is you have to go and get a little bottle. It's usually like um, about so, so big of um, uh, effectively sulfuric acid. And you pour it into the battery, and then they will charge it up for you, and you're good to go. Um, I've got a little tiny wall wart, which has actually got an LM317 on it and a bleed resistor. I don't really care whether or not it's RF noisy and all the rest of it because I'm only using it to recharge the battery. So when I get some sleep, basically, I just plug it into the, in, into the, into the wall and literally connect, up the, connect, up the, um, um, connect it up to it so it recharges. It's a lead-acid battery, as I'm sure everyone here knows. It doesn't suffer any of the vagaries of the charging requirements of lithium-ion 
or nickel metal hydride, you can abuse the living daylights out of them and they still work. Um, also, the other thing is, what's a really nice thing to do is, if you're going to go somewhere like I have in Gambia, I was operating on the beach for ages, and I've got a photo, you'll probably, if you've been to my blog, you'll have seen it. What I didn't show in the photograph is the security guys who've been looking after me were actually just out of shot. And while I was there, I noticed they had one of these little tiny portable TVs, and they were, f um, this is when, um, it was 2015, so the uh, run-up to the, sort of like, um, uh, the World Cup was on. So I decided to basically, at the end of the trip, because they'd been looking after me, rather than give them sort of like a, a backhander, I asked them if they wanted the batteries. they would not be funny. You could, they, they would have taken my arm off, I tell you. <laughs> so it works really well. Um, it's just a rough, rough idea. What does this all look like when I actually end up going somewhere? Battery, for obvious reasons, is a blue thing. Um, I've got one of these little inspection lights that I quite often use um, under my car. It runs off 12 volts. To be honest, I only need it if I really need it, because to be honest, you get used to be able to work in really low light conditions. Two KX3s. I actually have got an Aircraft T1, which is an external tuner. Simple reason I've got it is basically plug it into the antenna, make certain it's tuned before I plug it into my KX3, because I don't want to lose those. I'd rather lose the tuner. Radio, obviously, headset, etc. So um, I'm sure it makes a lot of sense. There's not, a, not an awful lot of kit there. Um, I don't only take all this stuff myself. I sometimes actually use someone else's shack. Um, I don't know if anyone recognizes it, but that's Jackie, 3B8 Charlie, Fox, Charlie Whiskey's shack in um, Mauritius. I went there in 2008. Um, he's got uh, a four-element monoband Yagi on 20 meters and a three-element on 15. Um, not be funny, if you have got an antenna set up like that and your QRP, especially if you can get him to turn around and upgrade his coax before you arrive. <laughs> um, I actually turned around and sent him a, a reel of RG, RG213 and basically so it's all new coax when I arrived, which was brilliant. Um, I operated um, QRP from there. Some people call it holiday style. I don't know what people's thoughts are, but if, when you lug in all this lot and you're going somewhere for radio, it's not a holiday. <laughs> but um, I operated from there QRP. 2008, there were no sunspots. I've got no idea what a K number or an A number or a rose propagation numbers mean, but in real terms, basically, everyone said absolutely no propagation was possible. I put 18, 1,800 QSOs in the log QRP, and I worked 70 DXCCs, and that's not bad for a week. <laughs> so I had fun doing that. If I'm taking my own stuff, what exactly does this all look like? That's on the beach in um, Gambia, outside the hotel. I told you where I got zapped. Just out of sight is where the um, uh, security guys are sitting. On the bottom, the very bottom left, that's me actually sitting on an island, which is a sandbar three miles into the Atlantic, off um, uh, the, the Gambian coast, basically. You, you got out there in a little tiny um, hard ridge boat. Now, I kid you not, basically, they had mangrove roots plugging the holes in the bottom of the boat. <laughs> And when we did the second trip, I did two trips on the, on the one day. When we did the second trip, we hit something in the water. And all of a sudden, all these mangrove roots popped out, basically, and the boat started filling with water, um, which is the reason why. Because the first time I, went, I did a trip out there, I did a trip in 2013, and the boat capsized. I didn't use my, my brain beforehand. So um, as everyone knows, salt water and RF kit don't mix. So whilst I could get most things back, I didn't get everything. But from that day onwards, basically, whenever I go on trips, I take these. It's a, a completely uh, waterproof bag. Basically, I put my radios in a lock and lock box. If you go to Tesco's and all the rest of it, you can buy them for about a fiver. Roll this up, put, the radio, put it into it. What I normally also do is find a stone or something on the beach, attach a piece of string to it. Then if the boat capsizes, this is just going to bob up and down and like that on the surface and just stay there until someone collects it again. So um, once bitten, twice shy, I've learnt my lesson. Um, so uh, that's what I do. This one, the, the middle one, is actually the same island as the first one, and I knew it was a sandbar because it all shifted. If you see the sort of like um, detritus on the beach, that's the high water mark. So for obvious reasons, I've plonked myself right at the high water mark, and that's the Gambian actually main mainland behind. Um, the GKRP in Sprat turned around and said it's the I was the lonely, loneliest DXer on earth. <laughs> <laughs> which I thought was fun. Um, I've also discovered one thing which works really, really well. Um, 
if you happen to go somewhere where there's um, sea defences, usually they've got lots and lots of rebar in them. If you happen to have an antenna that's horizontal, this is an oxymoron for some people, but basically if you have an antenna that's horizontal and you put it on the beach and you muck about and play with it and basically you listen for the maximum noise, you've suddenly got yourself a two-element beam. <laughs> so I've done that. This is actually um, um, in Sweden. Uh, Sweden has got a whole load of little islands, and I love doing island hopping trips and stuff. And up until about early 80s, there's a whole area in the south of Sweden which was actually classified as a military zone, and you weren't allowed to go on them. So almost every single one of these islands, from a QRP perspective, is brilliant, because not one of them's been activated. <laughs> so if you actually get the um, IOTA chasers and turn up, basically, it's great fun. Um, it's probably a little unclear to see, see in it. Um, I've got, a, I've got a vertical, uh, I didn't bring it with me, but I've got a Union Jack flag. As everyone knows, basically, when you turn around and fly your flag, you're supposed to fly the host nation's flag above yours. I had a Swedish pennant, which I put on there as well, basically, because the wind was so much, it blew the Swedish pennant off. <laughs> and the only thing that was left on it was the Union Jack. We actually had the um, Swedish police turn up and ask whether or not I'd invaded. <laughs> okay, um... We are where we are, basically. Everyone wants to know, how, what, what, what are your numbers like? How many, how many of you actually um, contacted before? So let me see if I can figure this out. I'll probably have to come out of the presentation. Uh, bear with me for a second. Uh, where did I put it? There should have been a link to this. I forgot to add it. Right, yeah. Oh, does anyone else use Dropbox, by the way? Yeah. If you're a QRP here and you're going to go anywhere in the world, I'd advise make certain you put your logs in Dropbox. There's nothing better than basically if you lose your laptops or something doesn't work, you've actually got to copy them somewhere else. Um, Rob did a wonderful talk the other day about basically you can turn around and take an Iridium sat fan and all the rest of it and upload your logs wherever. I'll be honest, I'm awful. Um, it takes me months and months and months sometimes to actually upload logs to Log for the World or Club Log, etc. Sometimes I do it on a whim. It's usually because I've actually paper logged it and I haven't transferred it to the plane yet, or tra transferred it to the um, computer yet, which I quite often do on some of the trips. Anyway, right, let's see if I can find this. Uh, dun, 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 my numbers. Uh, ah, I've got this. God. Right. <coughs> Hopefully they'll appear. Fingers crossed. Let's show it. Right. Um, that's the number of QSOs I've actually managed to make in the different locations I've been in. And usually those have only been week long trips and all running QRP. Um, by the way, these are not claims, these are actually ones I've got QSL cards for. <laughs> um, the actual numbers will be much higher. So, um, if you want to, it's possible to actually be a DX operator QRP and actually, you know, run some serious numbers. I mean, it's not sort of like um, a TXF sort of like category, but um, I'm, I'm pleased with it. Um, it's quite, quite amazing though, though. The number of stations, number of locations I've got no data um, QSLs for, they all insist on sending me um, OQRS requests for QSL cards, but they never send me one at all, which I think is really unfair. Anyway, let's go back to the presentation. Uh, anyone think those are, those are reasonable or not? Oh, um... Just about every one of those trips was probably, I mean, a couple of them. This is a trip that was actually literally just a 12-hour op operation. Um, I don't know, 207 QSOs, QRP in 12 hours isn't too bad. Um, the C5 ones, basically, that was actually spread over two different trips, um, both of which I had actually managed to get onto the island. And Alpha Foxtrot 060, which is what the IOTA was, basically, Again, not be funny, if you're a QRP operator and you go somewhere, it's a DX, so it's rare anyway. Then go to an IOTA, you can add another kilowatt to your signal. Yeah. <laughs> All of a sudden, you're getting 599 reports back from people you wouldn't dream of being able to contact normally. Um, but no, it's a, it's a lot of fun. Um, right. I've lost this stupid thing. 
How am I doing time-wise? Uh, how do I get this back? Oh, God. Uh, yeah. Sorry, I do apologise about this. Rob, how do I get it back on the screen, do you know? Oh, there we go. All right, here we go. Thank you for that. Oh, God, here we go. Right. Um, so I think everyone knows this one. This is a bit of a joke, but it's the, tr it's the truth. Um, it especially happened to me on the last Gambia trip, which was only last March. Um, has anyone actually got a $100 QSL card request? <laughs> I got several. Um, and what I think is hilarious is basically I, I got requests on the basis of I knew I wasn't even on that band or mode. <laughs> but apparently they still insisted. On put so um, quite often I literally just turn around, not in log, back on their QSL card, thanked them for the donation, gave it to charity, <laughs> and then turned around and sent the card. Um, one of the things that's... Um, I'll ask if there's any questions, by the way, but... but this photograph, it's a bit unclear to see. Um, I, I was asked once to turn around and explain amateur radio to a local, um, and he turned around and literally deposited his... I said, fine, no problems at all. He deposited his five-year-old kid on me and turned around and asked me to turn around, can I please explain what amateur radio is all about? <laughs> so that's what happened. Um, this, by the way, um, I found incredibly useful. For the simple reason, if you actually have got people who are not radio people, all they know is their local area. They've never been anywhere else. If you turn around and take an inflatable globe, it's very, very easy to explain to someone else where you are, where you've come from, and where you're working. Um, one of the best funs, uh, fun bits I've ever had is basically, I actually went into a school on Mauritius, and I set up my station in the playground, fed the coax through the window, and I actually worked with um, um, a bunch of sort of, I suppose they'd be sort of the fifth formers effectively, and explained to them exactly what I was doing and who I was, who I was speaking to. And I think they ended up playing football with this around the, <laughs> around the classroom. <laughs> but it's all kind of fun. So has anyone got any questions? Because I, 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 to be honest, this was condensed from about nine different presentations, and I've got hundreds of photos and stuff. I'm sure anyone's got any questions. <laughs>